G'day guys, welcome back to Supercoach with DR and welcome to the Around 16 stock market video. Hope you've had a cracking week so far. The buys are over and most of us now have completed our sides and are now looking for that elusive 23rd man. Some people may be still one or two away and that is absolutely okay. Some of you may even have that 23rd man already, which is even more of a bonus. So congratulations if you're in that particular spot. But what I thought I'd do this week is something a little bit different. Again, we did the pods the week before. This week, it's all about your requests. So I gave everyone the opportunity to put in a player request. Who do you actually want me to cover? Because I know that lots of you don't want to go through names upon names on every line. You're just keen on maybe one or two particular players from a particular line. If you've got some of those 50-50 decisions, like I know many people did, I've included the players that you want of there. Unfortunately, if you did miss out on the cutout time, then I may not have included it. But fingers crossed, there were some great minds like yours and the players already been requested. But we do have five here on the thumbnail. Right at the top, we've got Jai Simpkin. I was thinking Trap the previous week. Now, after a second 100 plus performance, he could be the bloke that we're looking for as that 23rd man. Mr. Trent Rivers, a lot of requests about him this week as a pod down back, playing in the midfield now. We'll talk about him. Could be a decent option. Jai Caldwell, right in the middle. Mr. Consistent, I'll call him the safest houses pick. We'll discuss him. Nat Fife, I own this bloke. And it's not fun at the moment. It may be time to move him on. And unfortunately, I also own the bloke with the piece of poo on his head. Because after that 32 last week, I cannot look at this man anymore on my side. And he's simply got to go. Piggy, what are you doing to us, mate? Just not good enough particularly when you've got him at M8 on field. So we'll talk about what to do with Clary. If you're looking to trade him out, we'll give you some of the options that people have requested anyway. But let me know, um, give me a bit of feedback, guys, about how you like this request video. If you want me to go back to just covering every player like I always do, happy to do that. But at the end of the day, I'm here to try to do my best to help you guys out. So let me know uh, how you feel the best way that I can do that. And I'll be more than happy uh, to go with that way. So uh, that's it for the intro, guys. Hope that you're all well. Let's start off with the defenders and see who is at the top of the request list this week. At the top list this week, we have Colby McCurcher. Now, I did hear somewhere that he was training with the B team, so not sure if he actually gets selected this week, even given the fact that he's fit and available, but surely... After his performance on the weekend, he comes straight in. What a frustrating hold he has been if you've been patiently waiting a return. My advice was to trade weeks ago, but as an owner, I guess if you've gone this far, then you stick it out. Did dominate the VFL last week, as I said, in just three quarters. So certainly think he's a chance to play, hoping he does for owner's sake. As a trade-in option, certainly value there if he comes right back into that defensive line carries on from where he left off before that injury but as a young kid i'm not sure what we can expect does he get straight back to it or not 102 135 and 91 in his last three is very impressive and a break even of negative six is really a match made in heaven so can he keep it going it's a bit of a question after that layoff i'm not too sure if you think he can i think he's a try fine trading option uh, trent rivers has people interested as a pod who presents value at his current price why is it so? It's all about the role. When he moved into the midfield last week, he scored a 131. Before that, his last six scores read 111, which is awesome, but 54, 72, 73, 83, and another 73, which really does provide no relevance. So the obvious question is, does he actually keep the role? I'm not 100% sure, and I don't know if anyone but Goody does, but I can see him staying there in current form for sure. With Salem out, there may be a chance he moves down back again, but... Surely someone else can do that job with track out. Clary's in woeful form. Someone needs to step up. And I think it should be him. Would be super surprised if he cops a tag. So no worries there. Huge pod, lone wolf move, but it could certainly work out. However, if he does return to that old role, there are massive alarm bells and we'll see his average start to free fall. That's what the data suggests anyway. So this is a week to do it if you can. If the 80 percent cba rate from last week is maintainable which i don't think it will be look even 65 to 70s is fine then 
I think it'll be a superb pod, even when he had his second highest CBA rate and it was his only other CBA rate of the year in round five with 33%. He also scored a ton. So as a defender, he's meh, but as a midfielder, he's great. So he could be a very sneaky selection and one more for the risk takers, I think. But yeah, definitely go there. If you've got the competency, he keeps a role. Uh, SDK, what a battle it was. Smashed early by his brother, but then held his own. 135 points from 20 touches, 5 tackles, 20 hitouts, 3 frees, 4 and a goal. Will he continue in the role? It's like Rivers. I really have no idea. To put it simply, if he doesn't play in the ruck, I wouldn't go near him. They could quite easily just throw Blitzarves in there. You know, Geelong have always been notorious for that ruck roundabout. So... He's probably too much of a risk for mine, unless you've got some inside info coming out of Geelong that suggests otherwise, or you've heard something that would suggest that he continues to play in the ruck. Just, I'm not too sure, so I can't really recommend him there. Uh, the Pepsi Max King, my boy, been playing well lately, has not missed a game since his debut in our final against Richmond. He's been scoring well, but not absolutely banging down the door. You know, 113, 88, 81, 119. Than a 94 last week. Seems to have built up his game to a decent floor, a safe type option, but I'd much rather go a McKercher type as much as I would love to highly recommend to my man. Jack Sinclair is my favourite defensive trading option of the week, and I think he's flown under the radar until recently, so he does warrant a bit of discussion. Look, there are some potential red flags of a tag from a McEntee selected this week and then Jordan the week after, but does seem okay apart from that. And as a defender, we all know what he's capable of in the role. He's all Australian quality, decent premium scoring history from the past. And since round seven, his lowest score is an 83. And everything else has been 99 and above. He's gone 113, 134, 83, as we said, 110, 99, 102, 147, and a 135. He plays nine more games for the season and eight of those games are at Marvel. Does not leave the state. His scores read 71, but don't fear. And I'm going to look back to 2023. So back to 2023, his, what are they, the last eight scores I'll give you at Marvel. 71, 133, 96, 132, 113, 99, 115, and then a 137. And there's every chance that history repeats. In rounds 8, 9, and 11, he had a CBA rate of 72%, 68%. And 93%. And two out of those three games, he scored below 100. So he's a man that we want playing in defense. Went down to 0% CBAs in his last two. And that's actually allowed him to produce his two highest scores of the season. The last two weeks, he's taken the most kick-ins for the Saints. And one of those games was with Wanganeen Miller, where it was Sinclair 4-2. So a jack down back is certainly worth a crack, in my opinion. If you want to go there... I would certainly recommend it. The price at 580, he isn't cheap, but he does have a lowish break even. And look, we don't look too much at break evens when we're looking to make our last upgrade. So look, I really like him. You may disagree and say that with those potential tags coming up that he may be worth just waiting and then jumping on in say three to four weeks potentially. But for me, I think he's really showing us at the moment that He's one of the defenders that we want. And look at a stretch. Would you even consider bringing him into your midfield? Could come in for someone like a Clary for me anyway. Will Powell returned to the side after being suspended for what seems like forever. 103 and 106 pre-suspension. And then a 117 on his return. So I can see why the request was here. Only the one kick in last week, but had 24 touches. So certainly not reliant on that to hit the stat sheet. 12 marks and 5 tackles. But I'm really hungry to get back out there with the boys. And it seems like a reliable three-rounder. But remember before that, he had a three-week period where he scored... 59, 75, and 68. So if you think his run of 100-plus scores continue, then he could be a pod to target and under 485K. Uh, Massimo, gone up over 230K from his starting price, coming off the bye, facing West Coast this week. It seems like after we all traded him, he's come good and found some consistency. He went downhill from round 6 to 9 with scores of 60, 44, and 52, but then really bounced back to form. 102, 107, 103, 92, and 106 had 20 or more touches in each of those games, has a solid kick to handball ratio. So 
For a five week stretch, that's an awesome range for consistency. It comes with DPP to swing as a bonus. So 19% of the comp still own him. It's not a real lone wolf move, but if you look at the overall ownership in the top 1%, He's owned by a total of six coaches, so very much a different scenario when you get to the top. Uh, Nick Lawson, a request from my man Pete Dockery. Hope you're well, legend. Well, in good news, Nick got a 100-plus score on the weekend, but unfortunately, I think that's where the good news sort of stops mine, mate. He's gone really downhill after a fantastic start to the season. One, if you're desperate and have a bare bank account, you know, before the 106 last week, He's only scored an 82, 64, 73, 58, and a 51 in his last five. So unless he gets back to his first month of scoring with those efforts like the 118, 134, 167, and a 111, I don't think he's worth the trouble. Seems like a high ceiling loop player at best, but then again, doesn't have that DPP bonus that's probably required for that position anyway. So sorry, Pete, but I don't have a lot of faith here, mate. But if you do, he could be great at the price. All the best, buddy. Uh, Nicky Martin, after three weeks of scores in the 80s and 90s, Nicky Boy finally hit the ton against West Coast with a 112. Up until round 10, he was looking like a lock, but spending some more time up forward, in the middle, on a wing, his scoring's just decreased. Just, yeah, not looking like top six at the moment. He's definitely that next tier down, and one we'd ideally like to upgrade, but he won't be the worst D6, but D five or higher, then you may be in a little bit of trouble compared to some other teams. Uh, and Lukey Ryan, well, he's not the player I'd like to invest in at the moment. I can't believe I'm saying that after the season he's had. After Longmuir's comments, I'm slightly concerned, but I certainly wouldn't advocate trading him out if you've got him. I've heard a few people looking to do that, so no way that I'd do that. Although his three-rounder is extremely poor. I don't think it's panic stations yet, and he's been one of the best scorers in the game this year, so I would definitely hold, but don't invest. That would probably be my simple advice. On to the midfielders, 500k plus, and at the top, we have Georgie Wardlaw, a very, very late edit here. I talked about Georgie for a while, but news has just come through that he'll be out for the next two due to concussion protocols. Such bad luck. The bloke is a dead set beast and apologies Causa. I was gonna give you a fair spiel about him mate in the members video, but unfortunately he's gone from next to no good as a trading option. Uh, apologies brother. Just, yeah, terrible luck this year mate. All the best though buddy. Your next bloke from North though, LDU from Bargain Basement a couple of months ago to inform player of the comp super coach wise, an absolute weapon that's firing out some big scores and rewarding blokes like my brother, Janeth. I talked about him a lot last week. Last game, he had another big score, the 148, to take his five-rounder to 135.6. That's elite. In the Swordplay potty, we talked about his fantastic run home and the green ticks there. Durability will always be a slight concern, though, so that's red flag here at the moment. Since round 13, his CBA percentage has actually dropped. It was a consistent 80s, pushing up to low 90s even, but in the last three, it's been 65, 70, and 68%, and that's with the addition of Simpkin and Phillips into that midfield, but his scoring obviously hasn't suffered, which is another positive. The price is high, but he's punching out very high scores. So he's still owned by under 10% of the comp. Big pod, and the temptation to say, get a clarry up to him, is very, very tempting for me. I would love to have him sitting in my side. Uh, Josh Dunkley, one of my Brisbane boys, certainly a pod selection. Only really seen his ceiling twice. One of those games being last week, 99, 104, 90, and that big 144 in the last month to round out his last four. Has a pretty decent fixture coming up, and with Neil and McCluggage, the real players that opposition coaches are looking to tag, that frees up Dunkley, and I think that he could potentially be a higher scoring option. History suggests that he's actually much better off with Ashcroft in the team. Janeth left this a little Easter egg, about how much Dunkley's average goes up with Ashy in the team, along with Lockie Neal as well. So well done if you tuned in for that. There is some potential upside if you think history repeats. Not a sexy type selection, but he should be safe for 
low floor type scores and provide you close to a top 10 to 12 midfield average from here, I think. Will Day. Now, a request from one of my favourites and most appreciated subscribers of the channel. I don't really like cheese. Regularly donates to the channel. Always brings up great discussion points. So, special shout out to you, brother. Hope you're well and always more than happy to help you out. Now, Will Day, what a player this bloke is. Future captain of Hawthorne, and don't at me with any other suggestions. I'll put my house on it. Watching him live was an absolute pleasure, and he's so silky as well as being tough as nails. You know, Hawthorne are on the rise. He's a big reason for that. A pod selection in basically no teams, and around that, you know, top 1%, he just doesn't exist when it comes to ownership. He hasn't gone below 100 since round 10. 142, 117, 107, 137, and 100 last week. It's got to put him into calculations. And I understand why you're asking about him, mate. Disposal counts, 27, 26, 23, 26, and 20. That means he doesn't need a lot of it to have an impact. He's been averaging six tackles a game during that time, which is something I think helps his floor stay relatively high and gets him to those triple figure type scores, particularly when he isn't completely dominating. He's sharing the CBAs a little bit more with McKenzie, well, did last week anyway, more than usual last week. So that may be something to note, mate. Has juicy matchups so with West Coast and Geelong in these next two where we could expect two more of those ceiling type games. You are paying up now. So I wouldn't say there's a heap of value, but he does have the fifth highest five round average for mids only. So that's a sneaky little stat for you there, Cheesy. And if you look to have what a decent player in your super coach semi prelim and grand final, his opponents are Carlton, who are leaking midpoints, Richmond, and North. So if you're looking for a lone wolf move, I think he could be a man, mate. Does have some durability concerns, but all in all, looks fit and firing again. So if you do decide to go there, I hope he smashes out of the park for you, Cheesy. All the best, legend, and hope that helped a little bit anyway. Libba, another request. A 104 and 127 upon his return, playing North, Port, Carlton, and Geelong in his next four. So not bad matchups, the next three. They do have midfield taggers, but not sure if they go to Libba. My main concern here is selecting a 30-something-year-old bloke who's missed a month due to concussion issues. Just too risky for mine. But if he does get back to his best, could be a good pod anyway for the run home. Errol Goulden. Man, oh man. I can't believe they aren't tagging this bloke. Poor J.D. Warner. Yeah, Errol's going nuts. And in last month, he's gone 131, 157, 106, and a 151. Crazy numbers from Errol. Hasn't gone under 20 kicks in last month either. And total possession-wise, in his last three, check this out. 37, 35, and 41, if you don't mind. So if you're prepared to pay up, I can't not recommend this bloke. And the way he's playing, if you jumped on after the buy, you'd be giving yourself a massive pat on the back. And kudos to you. If he continues to avoid the tag, I just don't see him slowing down. So you do have to pay up but he is absolutely smashing it out of the park. Uh, Noah Anderson, the old Noah Coaster, 55, 150, 105, and 93 in his last four. A tag target at times, and although he may have a favourable matchup against the Pies this week, there is every chance that he cops in the next three after that a Phillips, Drew, and Bedford tag. I could definitely see that happening. So that's what puts me off the pick, to be honest. Who knows? They may not go to him. I'm not too sure, but... He's got four scores of 149 plus. So when he goes big, he goes big. When he goes low, he goes low. Two scores in the 50s due to being tagged out of the game. So Shano, probably a no from me, mate. But hey, if you think that Noah Coaster is going to start to rise up again, then go for it, mate. I, I'm just not too confident in myself, buddy. Uh, Lockie Neal, another one of my boys, hit his third highest score of the season with a 149 against Port. The data is simple here. If he goes below 100, he scores between 70 and 80. If he goes above 100, it's 109 at a minimum. And I was surprised to see him avoid that tag last week when Drew went to the suitcase. And it seems like when he's able to roam free, he should deliver you a decent captain's score. It's all about future tags from here on out. 
If you're interested in that, check out the episode 14 of the Swordplay Potty, where we go through every possible tag, give you the red, green, amber lights here. We also will update this as the year goes along, but could possibly face in your Bullen and Michael Annie tag in the next two. But if he avoids them, I expect him to go big. Even with the tag game here and there, he should average enough to continue to push out top eight midfield scores anyway. Cripper had a decent run, oh, but nah, not look. If you look at his scoring of late, things seem normal enough. Like he's averaging 76% CBA rate over his last five, 103, 75, and 99 in his last three, though they don't give me any real reason to recommend him. So at 532k, I think I'll go all the way down to Rosie and just pocket the cash instead of trading in Cripper for over 100k more. So yeah, not really sure why we're going to look at a Cripper anyway. Uh, Adam Chalor, this bloke just cannot buy an owner this year. And the poor bloke, there's not much more that he can do. Only three scores under 100 for the year. And they're a pair of 94s and a 99. You know, you pair that with his ceiling, that high floor, you know, we're looking at scores of 153, 151, uh, what else have we got, 144. You've got a fantastic play here. The most preferred CBA mid, the Dogs, averaging 82% for the year. And that's never wavered through, you know, the Libba, the Richards injuries. I think someone else was injured there for a while. It's remained really, really consistent. Hearing that, you're asking, well, why on earth is he not in everyone's team? The only reason the veteran super coaches will be staying away is because of his injury history. We're worried that those hammies could go ping at any time. But other players such as your, what, your McGovern, well, they've proven me wrong with durability concerns this year. The other knock in the past has been a bit on his disposal efficiency, but he does get plenty of it. Only gone under 30 disposals four times this year. And they were, what, still in the mid to high 20s. So regardless of opposition, he tends to score well and avoids a tag. If you trust his body, I think you can absolutely go with him. He's a pod that has a consistent role, high floor, as well as a high ceiling. It's all about that trust factor. And Tuke Miller, well, he's had a very sad three-round average and not something you would associate with a premium player in any position, really, if... You've got him as your M8, M9 swing type, like my man Janet, then you're laughing. But if you're sitting at your, I don't know, your M, well, six to eight spot, well, I won't say you strife if he's M8. I'll say M6 to M7. You may be in a little bit of strife. He's only gone over 100 twice in his past seven games with a high score being 122 in that time. So that's not anything special. And to be honest, I just can't recommend him at the price. So one you could potentially luxury trade, but at the same time, I would never ride off the trademark. On to the rest of the midfielders under 500k, Jai Clark. One of the slower spoons you'll ever see, an absolute butcher and such a frustrating pick. I won't rag on the young man. He's got some talent for sure, but just hasn't been the pick we were hoping for. In his last game, he had 43% CBAs, equal with Tom Atkins. Did collect a solid 20 disposals, but only churned out a score of 31. That's all you need to hear to understand how bad the deficiency was. So I think it's a perfect time to downgrade him and just use the cash to make a final upgrade. This man deserves a bid discussion, and he was highly requested this week. It's Connor Rosie, a man that some paid over 600k for at the start of the season, and he's now available at a juicy 410,700. A 111 last week has put him right in the conversation as either an Oliver replacement or that 23rd premium. Now, right from the start, the only problem with him as your 23rd is that he's mid only and can only cover the one line. But aside from that, he is absolutely fantastic. He's a perfect 23rd and a fantastic luxury. In the Swordplay Potty, we talked about upgrading to a 23rd versus getting the breast premiums and you know looping for that next tier of under premiums. But if you're looking for more detail, then you can poke a stick at. Again, the Swordplay Potty from this week is where it's at. In his first five, he scored 114, 90, 102, 152, and 125. So we all know the scoring potential is there. You know, as a captain of the club, I expect him to lift his team, which should also lift his super coach output. May cop a tag, but 
you'd think that Butters is more likely. So all in all, at the price, I think it's a fantastic buy. 28 touches and seven tackles was a good return last week in what was a belting, let's be honest. And assuming Windy goes to Butters, he should be in for a decent day. So if you can afford the luxury, I think absolutely go for it. I had a request for Danger, who avoided suspension, and rightly so, in my opinion. The old fella certainly isn't the player he once was. Holds limited super coach relevance for mine, but I could be wrong. 57% CBA, 17 touches, 4 tackles for 94 super coach points. Only a single 100-plus score, and that came all the way back in round one. So a no from me, and if you look at that predicted average, I disagree with the 120 on screen. Uh, I had a request for Ashy, and look, the man is back, and that in itself is a massive win, not just for Brisbane, but for AFL footy in general. I listened to him speaking the other night, and if, in his own words, he said he's added some strength, bulked his upper body, obviously became even more of a student of the game, watching it from the sidelines with the coaches, so I'm hoping he'll be better for it, but I wouldn't expect too much from a young man as a super coach selection. It's a massive wait and see. I expect him to be named this week, but... Yeah, average-wise, I could not even guess. But I can certainly guarantee you that they won't be playing him in the VFL. We'll wait for selection news, but yeah, no way that I think he goes through the resis anyway. Uh, Clary, now we did have a very detailed chat again about him and the sword play potty, so well worth listening there for more details. But in a nutshell, it's no good. Things are no good. He'll clearly be the number one tag target now at the D's. He's had no preseason. He's giving so many frees against away in just frustration. And he's not gathering pig-like numbers. And to add to that, Melbourne as a side are not travelling well. He'll likely face the Berry tag this week. Just all red flags at the moment, aside from past history and potential. But remember, he's a different player at the moment. You know, can he get back to the old Clary? I absolutely think he could, but will it be this year? Sadly, I think the answer's a big fat no, in my opinion. I've kept the faith up until now, but I think it's just time to move him on before he's priced like a mid-rookie. You know, 92, 73, 97 didn't upset me too much, although still frustrating, but the 32 last week against the Roos just really made it clear that he's no longer got the privilege to be in Diaz Rusty Spoon's midfield, so... I'll see you again in 2025, Clary, at a very discounted price, my friend. You could just use him as a loop-type selection there. Hope that he gets a ceiling game from time to time-ish. But, yeah, I think if he's on your field, you just need to get him off. Trade him out, get someone else on. On to the big boys in the ruck, and only the two requests this week. The first one is TDK. My man, Janeth, was all over this man before the media started hyping him up, and look at what he has delivered. Check out that three-round average. It's not a mistake. 154, if you don't mind, after scores 131, 140, 146, and 176 during the last month. Took a really, really aggressive approach towards the contest. A bit of brotherly rivalry, as we talked about with Sam, but Tom easily got the chockies here, and he's by far the hottest pod in the comp. With no pit and A, he's clearly a top three ruck in super coach, and let's be honest, in the competition in general, I think, if you need a ruck and you've got the cash, you can't deny him. You're paying up, but... Look at what he's doing. You know, Janeth made a bold call a while ago that he's a generational type player. And his form over the last month suggests that he was bang on the money. And that's why my brother Janeth is the best of the best. So if you're in need of a ruck, look no further than TDK. And Dogger, well, I'll be honest, he isn't fun to own at all. And I can tell you that from experience. Don't get me wrong. He's got me out of a couple of sticky situations this year, but unless he's playing as that number one ruck when Darcy's out, all he is is really an insurance policy. And that's why you see that Amy symbol there. Would be ideal to get him to that F7 spot where you can afford to loop him every week and stash him for cover if needed. Not really a bloke that you want scoring on field though. And when he's playing as a key forward, it's, it's almost disaster zone. If you're low on trades, his ruck cover may be enough to sway you in itself. 
just given the fact that if one of your big boys do go down and you've got Livingston, for example, that you can swing him with, that could avoid a donut. But I just would not expect too much from him. And don't take too much notice of that projected score. As last week, it was off by about 60 points and threw a lot of people's projections basically out the window there. And down the bottom, you can see some of the Swordplay crew. Shout out to anyone that has ordered a beanie. Remember, Supercoach Swordplay dot com is where you can find all the merch thank you very much to everyone that has supported us and in supporting us by buying a beanie you're also supporting the rch thank you very much legends on to the first set of forward requests we've got a few this week up the top we have Jai simpkin a man in good form and a break even in the negative if you don't mind i thought he was a potential trap and he still might be but he backed up his 129 with a 114. The week before, he collected 28 touches, laid 7 tackles, kicked 2 snags with a CBA rate of 65%. Last week, had the 25 touches, only the 1 tackle and a goal with a 40% CBA rate for his 114. But with Wardlaw out for 2 weeks, he should benefit. 70% for George last week now needs to be spread around. The red flags here are the fact that his durability has to be questioned. And when he had two decent CBA rates of 60% and 54% in round six and seven, he only pushed out scores of 67 and 61. So no guarantee to score well, just because he's got that rate of say 40% plus. North are in form, he's part of the reason, but what happens if they start to dip again? I don't see this type of scoring being maintainable. If, if North do start to plummet, but who knows? They're on the up, and their captain is playing well. A solid 23rd man to link with due to his DPP. Rounds 19 to 22 are a dream run for North mids, and if you've got enough trades, but not enough bank, he could be even a short-term stepping stone to, say, a ranking type. So all in all, I've... Changed my tune a lot this week after seeing him do this for the second week in a row. I think there is some opportunity that's now presented itself for Simpkin to even increase that CBA rate in the short term anyway. So I have changed my tunes as I said. I'm not going trap. And I'm actually saying that if you are looking for someone out of the options you see under 300k, uh, sorry, under 400k, he's probably the man that I would take a very very good look at anyway but up to you two weeks form anyway suggested he could be decent uh bedford has transformed himself into a dagger plays the crows this week is it yes the crows this week who will he go to probably Rankin, but that's a wait and see in the role he's given us an 88 and an 86 and that was on butters and warner and at 300k He's got a negative break even coming into this week. He's actually lost set 37k of his starting price. You know, getting a lot of his points through tackles, it seems. Eight and nine in the last two, so a total of 17 in the last four, not which is impressive. Only averaging 16 touches, but as long as he can keep up that tackle count, he should give you around an 80 to 85 average, it seems, anyway. We don't have much data on him in the role, so we really have to go off those last two, but I think the role's there to stay. A really awkward price, but if he suits your budget, you may consider, but he's not a pick for me, though. Uh, Brucey Boy may be in a little bit of strife this week. With Ashy back in, there's a chance he could either start or come off as a sub. I'd rather see McKenna as sub, to be honest, but he has been named on field, so take that what you will. Does Ashy start as a sub? Possibly. Oh, the stretch maybe a Fletcher, but probably not. Good thing is that the Lions played the first game of the round, so we'll know whether or not Bruce will be the sub before we make a decision on whether or not to pull the trigger on him. He may have a bit more cash to make if he isn't subbed, but he's starting to max out unless we'll see a ceiling type score. So I'll just watch for the team sheets an hour before the first bounce for confirmation on who will be actually wearing that vest. Uh, I had a request for Liam Ryan, but I don't have a lot of faith in this one. 79, 28, 87 in his last three. 19 touches last week. That was his season high by plus six. So that's a slight positive as well as a possible shift down back, but not for me. And given these late games, 
it can't really be used as a loop. Forward option also puts me off. Could prove me wrong though. Jai Caldwell. We discussed this man at length in the Swordplay Potty this week, but given the fact we've had a fair few requests for him, and he's an option that I'm seriously considering for my side, we'll have a chat about him. So he should be a nice F6. The word here is safe. Seems lockable for a 90 to 100 average. And that type won't win your games. And at the same time, he won't lose your league games. You know, with set of field omitted, Parry's still a little while away. His role seems really secure. And his CBA rate was friendlier last week, one of the best. So aside from an injury-affected game against the West Coast, he hasn't gone under 80 since round three. So the floor and consistency for a forward at this price is actually fantastic. He made like the upside and ceiling of, say, someone like a Kerno, but you can pretty much lock in the fact that he won't give you a stinker based off this year's data anyway. I've got the safest houses symbol there, which was pretty much the most appropriate one that I could find. You know, that DPP is also an added bonus that might get you over the line. So I really like him and he's still relatively potish. So if you're big on Caldwell, yeah, don't blame you. Don't mind him yourself at all. Charlie Kerno may be the competition for Caldwell. And in my opinion, again, one of the best forward trading options this week. Coming off a bag of five, that Janeth, again, predicted. He scored a 118. And after that, it's really got people talking. People were talking last week, probably after they did listen to Janeth, but particularly after that 118 and that nice bag, it's looking good for Kerno. Now, his fixture is really nice and run home, and there could be some really nice scores in store for him here. As Brent was saying to me, he needed to kick five to score that solid 100 plus, so that is something to consider. Key forwards are very up and down, so don't expect big scores each week. It doesn't work like that with the key forwards, but he's leading the Coleman. The umpires love him. Carlton are in form, and at the price, I actually think he's a great option and prefer him, without a doubt, over Mackay. He continues to float down back late in quarters or to you know, halt momentum, which provides bonus points. He actually positions himself really well. So, look, for more detailed info, listen to Janice speak about him in the pod, but in a nutshell, he's got a great run with a big ceiling. A big bag could be awaiting him this week. He's playing the Tigers, so we're all expecting him to pretty much go bananas. I'm all for getting him in and very jealous of those that do. Uh, Alex Sexton, requested by a few actually, since his return, he's posted scores of 82, 118, 86, 100, 87, and 80. So it was sort of okay for a forward, particularly when you know, it was at that rookie price. But with blokes like Kerno now really putting their hand up, as we just mentioned, these scores are more of a concern. He was named not sub last week but did spend time playing on a wing at times which is not good we want him distributing off half back and taking those kick-ins he did get five last week though which is his most for a while so that's a bit of an interesting stat in itself because flanders is the one that normally takes those he's an absolute hog when it comes to the kick-ins and that's another thing to note if flanders does play in the midfield that's good for Sexy. Atkins has been playing well in the twos, but hopefully Sexton has done enough to keep his spot and at least avoid the sub vest. A great 23rd man to cover that forward line, but particularly that defensive line with your Dawson swing if needed. But ideally, one you don't want to be fielding if possible. If you don't need him as a loop and you can afford to, it may be worth even going to a Kerno. Personally, I have to hold him. But if you're in a different situation, yeah, up to you. He's actually fine to move on. Uh, Myers, I can see why the price is tempting. A couple of people actually asked me about Myers, but when he's delivered scores of 116, 105, 125, 96, and 119 this year, it's not as crazy as it sounds, but the floor isn't overly fantastic and the consistency is not there either. You know, low scores of 37, 65, 68, 71, 72, 77 hasn't gone above 85 in the last month, which is why we see him available at under 400K. He did peak at 495, so very close to 500. So if you can get back to that form, he could present some value, but I haven't seen anything in the last month to suggest that a change of form is coming. So a no from me, and I'd just 
rather take the punt on Simpkin. And Toby Green, one of the seven Tobys in the comp, similar to Myers, there isn't really much here for me. Only the one triple figure score for the year, and that's 100 on the dot. Had a 98, a 99 as well, so gone close a couple of times again, but his last three read 64, 76, 72, so you'd almost prefer a dowling here and pocket over 250k. Sorry, Tobes. And we'll finish off with the last of the forward requests. We got Shea Bolton. The roller coaster himself has been going down, down, down after a massive three round run from rounds four to six. But since round seven, his scores read 67, 36, 59, 75, 97, 84, and 68. We know his ceiling's huge, so he's always a handy 23rd man, but the floor isn't great. And at the price, I just wouldn't go there. Harry McKay, no hundreds for Harry since round six. And we have seen his floor in his last two with a 66 against the Dons and a 68 against the Cats. He does play Richmond this week, which is well noted. So a bag may be coming. Had his second highest score of the year the last time he played them. So I'll be, look, I'll keep it pretty short. As Janeth has already gone into detail about this on last week's potty, but I'd much rather pay up the little bit extra for Kerno. You can see their run there, friendly for both, but if you're comparing the two options, it's definitely Kerno for my No Kerno has that, I suppose if you'd call it extra type role, as we mentioned, floating down back. Harry, I suppose, has that other role floating up into the ruck at times, but yeah, just much rather Kerno at this stage. And that five. The man looks shot, and I hate to say it, but he just finds it so difficult to impact around the ground when he's not right in the contest. He gave us 100 not long ago, but after last week, it's become obvious that he just isn't going to cut it as that reliable 23rd man cover. It's scary fielding him. So since round nine, he's pushed out scores of 60, 63, 56. Then the 104, and we think maybe he's back but then down to a 51 and lowly 43 last week. Break even is at 111. And I think now's the time to cash him in before he potentially loses what another 50 to 100k. If he can somehow give us that 100 we're looking for, then he could reset in some way. But the risk is too great for me. And I'm pretty sure I'll be moving him on this week. It's been a rocky relationship with Nat this year. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Isaac Rankin. Now, another man that needs a bit of discussion. He's in fine form, delivering on his talent and potential now that he's been given more of a run through the midfield. She has the same break even as five, but their three round averages are vastly different. So let's look at the numbers. Since round five, he's been great. 121, 85, 113, 93, 142, 125, and a 96 last week in his comeback game from injury. Laird seems to have gone back for now. Crouch is out of the side, which should mean even more mid-time for him. Hopefully, he's kicked a goal in every game bar one this season, so that's a nice little bonus. Tellies of, where are we, 4, 3, 3, 1, and 2 in his last five games. A lot to like here, and he's also getting more of the ball, given he's running through the middle as well. We know that he did have a dream fixture a month ago. But that's now changed. And now we head into some of the potential negatives. It was already noted in the request that he's got the second hardest upcoming matchups for inside mids and the third hardest for general forwards. And that's basically where he plays his footy. This is what Janeth and I were going through with Spills the other week on the potty. He doesn't come cheap. And if he pumps out, or not pumps out, if he just pushes out a floor score, this could really see his price plummet. And it also seems that he's now becoming more of a realistic tag target. I'm not sure if Bedford, Bedford, Bedwood, geez, it's getting to the end, as you know. Not sure if Bedford is actually big enough to tag Dawson. So it may be Rankin that actually cops the attention. And that's probably why if, and I've been asked the question a couple of times, I know, that's why I'd probably prefer a one-trade Kerno in rather than a two-trade Rankin in, particularly if you've got less than, say, four trades. In saying that, 
clearly the bloke that you wanted F4 after your Flanders Heaney and Zorko. And I wish that I could afford him. Unfortunately, I can't. But he may not actually be the pick that some people are expecting. Hope he is and definitely does have the potential to. And don't let me scare you off whatsoever. It's just that run that slightly concerns me anyway. A couple more had uh, one person ask about Harley Reid. Well, finally the man's back. Footy's better for it, like we said with Ashy. Uh, what? I don't know really what to say about him. But we'll, we'll, we'll give a quick reminder about his numbers. Rounds four, five, and six were great. 91, 108, 147. And it's at that stage where we were calling him a potential keeper, potential forward primo. Then, though, he delivers a pair of 59s, follows that with another ceiling score of 138, then down again to a pair of low 70s. So we can't expect big scores week upon week. The consistency isn't there, but he does have that ceiling in him. He could be that 23rd primo, but he's only gone above 103 times, and that's probably not enough. So I can't wait to watch him play again, but as a trade-in option... I would just go somewhere else, I think. But yeah, again, wouldn't be surprised to see him go nuts at some stage. If Elliot Yo doesn't play this week, is he the man that really steps up in that midfield? Potentially, but couldn't go there myself. And we'll finish with Dylan Moore. I actually had a few requests for this man, but in all honesty, he's he's a bit of a roller coaster type pick. And look, he's gone what one thirty five. He's gone over one thirty five three times and he's gone under 61 to three times so there you go classic dylan moore plays west coast frio geelong and then the pies in the next four so apart from that big 169 it's a man it's a monster that 169 which gave owners massive relief his five other scores from last six weeks read 76 66 73 89 and 74. So if you take it, that one game out, and I know we can't just take the one game out, you know, someone like a Sexton is actually doing more on the Supercoach scoreboard, which puts into perspective how poor Moore has been apart from that game. So, oh, look, the difference is that Sexton, if you just say if you're comparing the two picks as an example, because uh, I did have a question, I think, sent through to me somewhere. Do I trade Sexton to more? So with Sexton, he lacks the ceiling and obviously the job security. But if you look at the way Moore has been scoring, he really isn't doing much better. So all in all, I wouldn't be making that move and trading more in over 530k. I think there are much, much better value options. And someone like a Kerno, for example, uh, a Caldwell, for example, I would much rather have in my side than Dylan Moore. But again, if you're a Dylan Moore fan, then I wish you all the best of luck. So that's it for now, guys. All the best of luck with your trade-ins and your trade-outs for this week. And I'll see you soon in the next one. Cheers, bye.